He that is mastered by Christ is the master of many circumstances. Peace rules the day when Christ rules the soul. Therefore, if you want an increase of Christ, there must first be a decrease of self. <clears throat> if you want Christ to increase in your life, then decrease your self-centeredness, selfishness, and self. Our topic tonight is stand your ground in faith. This is prophetic. <clears throat> stand your ground in faith. God's people, God wants us to stand our ground in the midst of storms of life. Maybe you are facing tremendous storm in your life. <clears throat> God says, stand your ground. Stand your ground in the battles of life. Stand your ground when the devil raises its ugly head against you. Stand your ground when the flood of dissipation comes. Stand your ground against the devil and his host. It does not matter what you're going through right now. God says, stand your ground. Stand your ground and see the onslaught of God against the enemy. Stand your ground and proclaim what you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Stand your ground in the midst of devil's attack. Stand your ground against all principalities, against all powers, rulers of darkness of this age. Stand your ground against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. Stand your ground against the tidal wave of wickedness. The world is full of wickedness. God says, stand your ground. Can God find faithful people in the midst of faithlessness? Can God find Noah of today in the wicked world? Can God still find lots in this land called Sodom and Gomorrah? Can God still find his people? Stand your ground against all demonic activities operating around you. Stand your ground in the word of God against all sicknesses and diseases. Declare war against all powers of the enemy. That's what the Bible says. Turn your Bible a moment in the book of Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3. Verses 9 and 10. Joel chapter 3. Verses 9 and 10. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Who? Did you hear that? <laughs> Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords. And your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Here God said, declare war. Proclaim war. In the war we're in, there's no demilitarized zone. Either you're on God's side or you're in devil's side. There's no DMZ. You got to go to war. Proclaim and declare war. That's what the Bible says there. Declare war in the heavenlies. Declare war against the powers of darkness that have come against you. Declare war against the infiltration of powers of demons. Declare war. Because we have a lot of, lot, there are a lot of places today called DIA. What is DIA? A demon infested areas. Therefore, God is calling you to declare war against all these areas, demon infested areas. Because these demons are raising all the ugly head against you, against your businesses, against your families, against the church, against Christians. Therefore, declare war. That's why God says, stand your ground. Call the mighty men. Where are the warriors? warriors? Where are those who are called to pray? Where are those who stand in a gap? Call them. Let them raise up their banner and begin to war in heavenlies. Let the weak say, I am strong. Why did God say declare war? That's a question tonight. Turn your Bible a moment in the book of Revelation chapter 12. <clears throat> You'll see something there. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12 chapter 12. 12 verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Did you hear that? You know why the devil has gone mad? You see why the devil is fighting against everyone? 
As long as you are called a Christian, devil is against you. As long as you are a tongue talker, demon chaser, carrying the fire of the Holy Ghost, demon is against you. Because he knew that his time is short. Therefore, he has to cause confusion everywhere. Therefore, he has to cause frustration to people's life. Whatever you lay your hand, they will try to attack them because he knows his time is short. Therefore, what are we supposed to do? God said, declare war. How are we going to fight this battle? The Bible declared in the book of Matthew chapter 16, verse, 9, verse 19 a moment. <coughs> Let's go there a moment. Matthew 16, 19. It says, Matthew chapter 16, in verse 19. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be lost in heaven. That's God speaking. Why did God say to declare war? Because he knew that the devil has gone mad. He's come down with wrath against God's people because he knows his time is short. Now God is declaring to us and telling all that, behold, he has given all the keys of the kingdom that what we bind on earth is bound in heaven. What we lose on earth lose in heaven. This time is not time of merry making. This time is not a time where you begin to shake your legs. This is a time to mean business with God. This is a time when you know that the power of prayer is real. This is a time you know that we are in a desperate situation whereby only God can help us. God said, I give you the keys. What you buy is buy, what you lose is lose. So sad that Christians don't even know what they have. So sad that Christians are going as if they are jelly, jelly people. So sad that Christians are behaving as if they have no power, they have no father. They are like orphans without a heavenly father. But God said, I gave you the authority. The same thing God repeated in the book of Matthew, chapter 18, a moment. Verse 18, 19, and 20. As sure as God gave us them. He says, as surely I say to you, Matthew chapter 18, verse 18. As surely I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be lose in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. That's what God said. Look at that assurance. What you bind on earth is bound in heaven. What you lose on earth, lose in heaven. And it tells you, whatever two of you agree on earth as asking shall be given to you. Whatever two of you agree. When two of you agree, what are you releasing? You are releasing what we call corporate anointing. Which devil cannot stand? Corporate anointing. And again, it says, where two or three are gathered in my name, and right there. And that's the same confirmation we get in Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. Where the Bible said that Christ is the faithful witness. He witnesses prayer that the people of God are offering unto God. Therefore, that's your right. That you need to stand your ground. When you see something happening, don't say, well, I think it's a normal thing. It's not normal, it's abnormal. You've got to take your right and begin to impose the will of God upon the devil. Because the devil seems to be mad. The devil seems to be deaf. He doesn't hear. You've got to impose the will of God, impose the victory of Jesus Christ upon the devil for him to do what? Back off. He needs to back off. And when God was speaking again, he declared to us in the book of Luke chapter, nine, chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Look at verse 19. It says, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. This is the word of God. God said, Behold, I give you authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions. Serpents and scorpions are symbols of Satan and demonic influences. Say, so I give you authority over them that you can march and trample on them and nothing will hurt you. This is God's word and that is your right in Christ Jesus. But he gave you that right. But the problem is many Christians don't understand that. That when they're bound, it's bound. When they lose, it's loose. That demon has no power over you, have no influence over you, unless you let him in. Unless you allow him to come in. Because he that's in you is greater than he that's in the world. Therefore, stand your ground. Many times when Christians face a little bit of problem, oh, oh, they end up crying. You know, Christians are very good in crying. <laughs> they cry and cry and cry. That's why the devil always says, please cry, so that they can spend more money in buying tissues. You see, that's the problem. 
So, you see, they cry and cry. Their health is affected and their pocket is also affected because they will buy more tissues to do what? To clean the tears. And they will say, please go ahead, cry. Please go ahead, cry. Don't pray. Please go ahead, cry. And they will also encourage you to talk to somebody. Therefore, you talk to somebody, talk about your case, tell somebody, talk about, and cry. But you never prayed. That's the problem with many people. But here, Bible made it clear that God said, what you burn is bad, what you lose is lose. You are not supposed to be afraid of devil or demons. Demons are supposed to be afraid of you. Because the Bible says you will cast out demons, not demons casting you out. Therefore, you need to go around and begin to tell demons, where are you, demon? I'm here to cast you out, not devil casting you out. So, so that many Christians don't know this secret. Now, let's go to the book of Matthew a moment, quickly. In the book of Matthew, again, chapter 8. Look at what the Bible, what, what the Lord says there. Matthew chapter 8, verse 26. But he said to them, that Jesus, why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the sea, and there was a great calm. What, is, what, what a miracle. The Bible told us how the disciples were scared when they saw a great storm and the wind. They thought they were going to perish, but they ran to their Lord. And here, what did he say? Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? How many times you become fearful when you face problems in your life? <clears throat> when people disappoint you. When people abandon you like abandoned property. When people just couldn't be bothered about you. When they just break your heart and find their way. Relationship you have managed to be up for many years. Just one day. Maybe they woke up from the wrong side of the bed. <clears throat> they break up the relationship. You end up crying. Why are you crying? Jesus said, why are you so fearful, O ye of little faith? Don't you know, whatever happened in your life, God had known it already before even it happened. Why are you fearful? Then you begin, you know what we do? When something happens in our life, we begin to look for solace from people. And devil begins to give people ideas to tell you what to do. And you begin to operate in flesh. You begin to listen to words that have nothing to do with the Bible. Because you want easy way. You want escape route. <laughs> You want to hear what you want to hear, not what God has to say. <laughs> That's the problem with Christians. When you tell them what the Bible is saying, they say, I cannot take it. You cannot take who take a take. Ah, I cannot take it. This is the problem with people. We don't want to listen to the right word, what God has to say. Do you know that every good idea might not be God, God's idea? But every God idea is always a good idea. Therefore, base your faith on the word. Say, oh, you of little faith, why are you fearful? Why are you afraid? Just because he saw the wind, he saw the storm, he saw the great storm, he said, ooh, I'm going to die. Who told you that? Don't you know, in the midst of storm, Jesus will speak peace, calm. By the way, don't you know that you cannot make a good seller or good selling in a smooth sea? You can only make a good selling in a troubled sea, how you maneuver. So it is only problem that will make you to prove that you're a Christian. Look. Things of life that comes to a Christian is like spices that make the soup to be delicious. So if you don't have a problem in your life, which means you're not a good Christian, you are a compromiser. You have compromised your faith. But when you have a problem, which means there is something in you that the devil is not happy with, that try to attack your faith to bring them down. Are you being crippled by fear and uncertain things regarding your present situation? Many people's faith have been crippled. They say, where is God? Where is God? And God say, hey, I'm here. <clears throat> I, I'm right here. You see, we are only asking where is God because we want God to do what we want him to do. Then when God doesn't do it the way we want it to do, we say, where is God? Where is God? But God say, I'm here. You are not the one to control God. God is the one to control you. You are not the one to tell God what to do. He will tell you how things have to go. That's all you have to know. How can you have a breakthrough? If you allow your heart to be overwhelmed with fear. The Holy Bible declares in the book of Mark, come with me a little bit, in the book of Mark, in chapter 11 of Mark, chapter 11, look at verse 22 through 24. What did he say? Mark chapter 11, verse 22 through 24. It says, So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. Have faith in God. That's what he said. In every situation you're going through, be it your business, be it your family problem, be it your relationship, be it whatever it is, have faith in God. 
have faith in God. In verse 23 it says, For as surely I say to you, whoever said to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Whatever you pray, whenever you pray, believe you will have them. It takes you nothing to believe God, but it takes you everything to be a Christian. You don't pay to be a Christian, but it takes you everything to stand as a Christian. Just believe God, that God is able, that he is able, and you'll see his miracle in your life. You'll see how he used you to prove that he is God in the midst of his people. We have to put our whole trust in the Lord, believing in his power and mind that God is able to see us through. It does not matter what you go through. What you go through is no more than what others are going through. All you need to do is just put your trust in God and know that God is able. You know our problem? We always think that we are supposed to have what we have. Now listen carefully. You should not have more interest in your business than God. <clears throat> you are not the owner of the business. God is the owner of the business. You cannot be more Catholic than the Pope. So you must know that. So you cannot say, well, I, I have to. The business is not yours. It belongs to God. Hand it over to God and let God prove himself. And tell God, here am I. Do what is your will and let your will be done. That's it. Even when the natural seems to be lacking, keep your eyes on the supernatural provision of God because God is able to do more than you ask and more than you think through the power that works through your life. When our eyes are off everything, let your heart rest in the Lord. Take your eyes off your problem and let your heart be rested in him. God is telling you, be calm, be calm. Be calm, my child. Be calm, my child, but we're not calm. We try to help God. You cannot, God doesn't need your help. You need God's help. God doesn't need your help. But you are the one who needs his help. But sometimes we are trying to do as if God needs our help. Lord, I want to help you to get that boy to love me. Lord, I want to help you to, for that employer to call me for interview. Lord, I want, you to help, I, want to, I, want to, I want to help you to run this business. God doesn't need your help. You are the one who needs his help. That's what the Bible says. He is the very present help in a time of need. You need God's help, not God needing your help. Let me show you something in the book of, let's go to the Old Testament. We've been dealing with New Testament all this while. <clears throat> Turn your Bible to the book of Joshua, chapter 6, a moment. Joshua, chapter 6, look at verses 1 and 2. It says, Now Jericho wall was secure. Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and a mighty man of valor. Look at that. Here is a city that is walled, secured, that the people of God cannot enter or come out. Highly protected. Yet, God told Joshua, Do you see this city? Highly secured and walled, that you cannot get in or get out, I have given it to your hands. The kings, the mighty valor inside, I've given everything in your hand. What a statement to make. Joshua could have said, what are you talking, Lord? How can you give it? How can you give it? I can't even enter. I can't even come out. Oh, what do you mean, Lord? Many times we try to use our logic to question God's authority. Question the authority of Satan and not the authority of God. Jericho City was fenced with high walls, tightly closed up because of the people of Israel. But God said, I have given you this city. When God speaks, you just have to say amen. God says what he meant, and he meant what he says. You must always know that. God says what he meant, and he meant what he says. Book of Numbers 23 declared and said that God is not a liar. What God has spoken will come to pass. You don't need to use your so-called logic to understand God. Logic doesn't reach God. One plus one, two. Two plus two, four. <laughs> but a three plus one is not four. You see, that's where we get, make problems. You can't use logic to reach God. You must come like a little child. Now look at the instruction God gave to Joshua. Whenever God had spoken to you that he has given you this, God will give you instruction on what to do. But remember, the instructions of God for success many times become foolishness to man. 
Because man cannot figure it out. How can you say divide the sea? We don't need to divide the sea. We want to cross over. But when Moses cried out to God, God said, what is in your hand? He said, Rod, divide the sea. Bible told us that in the book of Exodus chapter 14, at the time you're going to read that, from verse 13 down to 16, God said, divide the sea. Can you use a rod to divide a sea? Can you imagine you've gone to South China Sea, you say you want to divide it. People look at you, that's something that you've gone 13 o'clock, that something is wrong. But God said, divide the sea. Every time God gives instruction, don't question him. He meant what he said, and he said what he means. Now look at the instruction of God in the book of Joshua, chapter 6, from verse 3. He said, you shall march around the city, and all men of war, you shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of rams, horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. You see what God said? God begin to give instruction. When you read all the way from verse 3 through 17, God gave them instruction how to march around the Jericho wall once a day for six days. On the seventh day, they have to go seven times and blow the trumpet. God always gives his people instruction on how to do things. But there's something I want to tell you. Many times people begin to doubt. People begin to say, how can we do it like this? And I want to tell you something. God doesn't normally repeat his ways, but he wants us to remember them. Now I give you an example. The Bible told us when the people of Israel crossed the Red Sea, God spoke to Moses and said, divide the sea with a rod in his hands. By the time of Joshua in the river Jordan, God did not say, where is the Moses rod? Divide. Or go and get a rod for yourself and divide. No. God told him, when the priests who carry the ark, the moment their feet touch the brim of Jordan, it will divide. You see, different way. Many times, that's how we miss God. We always think that God, the way he did last year, is how he's going to do this year. And that's why we begin to imitate things. God will not be there. Maybe it is in a service, and the presence of the Lord came like wind. That does not mean another year say, look, by this time last year, the wind came. So if there's no wind, you go and buy one machine and say, blow the wind. It doesn't work. This is the problem with mankind. We like to repeat what God has done instead of allowing God to do his work. We try to help God. God doesn't need our help. Now, if you come with me in verse, the same chapter of Joshua, look at verse 14 through 17. And the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. So they did six days. But it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and march around the city seven times in the same manner. Now, remember the instruction? God told them, for six days, you must go only once. They did not tell God, Lord, we're in a haste. Once it's not enough, let's go 20 times. Many times, that's human being. We try to help God. Leave God alone. Let him do his work. He instructed them once every day for six days. But on the seventh day, you must go seven times. And so they did. And in verse 16, and the seventh time it happened when the priest blew the trumpet that Joshua said to the people, shout for the Lord has given you the city. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction. It and all who are in it, only Rahab the harlot shall live. She and all who are with her in the house because she hid the messenger that we, that we sent. You see one thing, God does not forget the good works of his people. Rahab the harlot protected God's people and God preserved her. When the onslaught came again, the city where she dwelt. If you're a child of God, no matter what happened in this city, God will preserve you. Because God, you, the, 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 the signature of God is upon you. God's sign is upon your life and God will preserve you. That we saw them. Beloved, it is something that's something we got to see here. Maybe you have a strong Jericho wall in your life. I tell you, if you believe, 
it will completely fell flat in the name of Jesus. It does not matter what you're facing in your life now. But there's something we need to know. Let us not be gripped with fear. Many people are gripped with fear. I can show you that in the Bible, and that's what it's been killing many people. In the book of Numbers, a moment. Look at Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. Look at verses 1 and 2. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. You see? When fear comes into your life, you begin to think negative. When fear comes into your life, you begin to think otherwise. When fear comes into your life, you become like an orphan without a heavenly father. Fear. Fear is enemy of your faith. When faith comes in, fear walks out. When fear comes in, faith walks out. They cannot dwell under the same roof. Why must it attain fear? The Bible says God did not give us spirit of fear, but a power of a sound mind. Fear. Grip the people. Are you gripped with fear? But look at what the Bible tells us quickly in the book of Hebrew. Hebrew. Maybe you're a person who has been gripped with fear. Look at what the Bible says in the book of Hebrew, chapter 10. Look at verse 22 and 23. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having conscience, I mean, having our heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith, of our hope, without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Don't waver. Hold on to God. Know that God is able to do what he has promised, for faithful is God who promised you. That's what he says there. Hold on to what you believe. Faithful is God who promised you. Now turn your Bible a moment in the book of Hebrew again, chapter 3. Hebrew chapter 3. Look at verse 14. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. You see, hold on. Hold on your faith. Hold on what you used to have. Hold on. If you hold on, just as you've been holding on right from the beginning. Do not give up your faith. Do not give up on your faith. Do not give up on the truth that you believe in. The word of God is life. Don't give up. Don't ever allow Satan to rob you that. Regardless of men's logical reasoning or ideas about religion, our God is real. God is real. I always tell people this. God is real. The problem with mankind is that mankind don't have intimate relationship with God. When was the last time you heard from God? When was the last time you really see a true vision from God? Not vision you fabricated. You know, some people can just close their eyes and say, I saw vision. I saw vision. You say, what did you see? I think. Look, when you see something, you don't need to think about it. If I tell you that I see somebody with red shirt, why must I tell you, I think it is green. You didn't see anything. Because seeing, you can see exactly what you saw. So hold on to what God has kept for you. Hold on to the relationship that you have with the Lord. The Bible told us in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 8, that Jesus of yesterday is Jesus the same today and forever. He doesn't change. I call him unchanging changer. He changes our situation, but he himself changes it not. If you have your trust in the Lord, you'll not be afraid. We have only one mediator between man and God, and the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. He's the one who has come to redeem us and keep us moving. Many times people use crooked ways to deceive themselves. If you can keep your eyes on the Lord, allow God to be real. When you go to your bed, just tell God, your grace and your mercy is what I need, Lord. Open my eyes to see. Speak to me in dreams, visions, and revelation. Speak to me. Let me hear your voice and see what happens. Call upon him. He will hear you. That's why in the book of Psalm, chapter 50, verse 15, he said, Call upon me in a time of trouble. I will answer you, and I will relieve you, and you shall glorify my name. Jeremiah 30, 33, he said, Call upon me, and I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. God will show you. Reach out to God and embrace his truth. And things will be changed. 
Let's look at the book of Matthew a moment. Chapter 13, verse 20 through 25. Uh, 20 through 23. It talks about the word of God. Many people have the word of God, but the devil will steal away from them. But God wants us to have a word that will remain in us. Word that will keep us moving. Word of God that give us life. Word of God that, that bring about stability in your life. Word of God that bring about new strength in your life. Word of God that will keep you moving on without you being destroyed. You know why many people are like flaky people today? Because they don't have word of God. They don't know what this Bible says. They're not sure. They just know a few things here and there. They never dwell in telling God, teach me thy word. Whenever I open this Bible to read, I tell God, let me draw from the hidden treasures of your word. That's my prayer. There are hidden treasures, and I begin to put them out. And that is what strengthens me in my faith. So that when I pray, I know that God is able to do more than I ask and more than I think. So that when I pray, I know I have God who answers prayer. Turn your Bible a moment in the book of 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at what the Bible says there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and reestablish and establish you in every good word and work. You see what the Bible says there? Hold on to that faith you have received. Hold on to those things that God has given to you. Hold on to that word of God. Don't be deceived. Hold on to the unadulterated word of God. What keeps you on? What makes you to be different from another person is God's word. Because you live by it, you allow it to become every part of you. That's why Job said, I treasure your word more than the very food I eat. Let's treasure the word of God more than the food we eat. Let the word of God become a lamp on our feet and a light on our path. That everything you do, you must bring it to the light of the word of God. If it doesn't have anything to do with the light of the word of God, you say, I will not do it. It doesn't matter how attractive or seduct seductive it is. You say, no, I am not going to soil my life. Now, let's look at miracles of transformation when we stand our ground in everything. I just look at through the scriptures what God did concerning life transformation. Peter, the profane fisherman, as the Bible told us in the book of Matthew 26, 74, became the man God used his very shadow to heal the sick. The book of Acts, chapter 5, verse 15. Can you imagine that? The power of transformation. If you allow God to reach out, if you stand your ground, there will be great transformation in your situation. There will be transformation in your family. There will be transformation in your business. Secondly, the Bible told us in the book of Mark, chapter 5, verse 5, the restless demoniac, the man who was under the power of demons, became a quiet disciple in the book of Mark, chapter 5, verse 15, because of the power of transformation. It does not matter how restless you are in your business, in your work, if you can only allow yourself to stand on the word of God, stand on your faith, you will see a great transformation of quietness. Thirdly, in the book of Luke, chapter 9, verse 53 through 54, John, the vindictive Jew, become the apostle of love. 1 John, chapter 4, verse 7. This is a man who was too vindictive, very angry, want to retaliate, went to take vengeance. Because of the power of transformation, he became an apostle of love. Church, regardless of how your heart has been, if you stand your ground, your entire posture will be completely changed and transformed from inside outside. What about the woman of Samaria? A woman of immoral attitude. She had immoral attitude and immoral reputation. As the Bible told us in the book of John, chapter 4, verse 17 through 18, she became an evangel of faith. John, chapter 4, verse 29, life completely transformed, changed, because of standing on God's word. What about Saul? Saul of Tarsus. 
saw the bloodthirsty persecutor. As the Bible told us in the book of Acts chapter 9, verse 1, he became Paul, the tender-hearted brother. The book of Acts chapter 21, verse 13, completely changed, transformed. I always say it. The only one who doesn't have hope in life is a dead person. As long as you have life, there is hope. I don't easily give up on people. That's something with me. I don't easily give up on people because I always believe that people can change for good. I always believe that God is able to touch people regardless of how vindictive or how persecuting they could be. I always believe that. Now, what about the cold-hearted Philippian jailer? In the book of Acts chapter 16, verse 23, he became a sympathetic friend. The book of Acts chapter 16, verse 33, completely changed. He was cold-hearted. He couldn't be bothered. He couldn't care less. But you see how life was completely changed. He became a sympathetic friend. Be strong, God's people. God told us in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, a moment. He said, be strong, his people. We need to be strong. Ephesians, chapter 6. Look at verse 10 through 12. There the Bible told us, Apostle Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the powers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. What you are facing in your life is not ordinary. There are spiritual things. We are fighting against unseen forces. Don't blame your friend. Oh, how come he treat me like that? How come he cannot call me? How come he's he behaving like this? No. Listen, you are not dealing with human beings. You are dealing with unseen forces, demonic forces. You are dealing with forces that are beyond your physical eyes. Therefore, you must know whom you are fighting with. Then you, be, you can see a total change in your life. As we look through the Bible, God said, be strong. Be strong in your resolve. Be strong in the Lord. King David spoke to his son Solomon to be strong. 1 King chapter 2 verse 2. Prophet Azariah, the son of Oded, spoke to King Asa to be strong. In the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 5, chapter 15 verse 7. It says, be strong and let not your hand be weak. In the book of Isaiah chapter 35 verse 4, Prophet Isaiah declared that let all fearful people be strong. If you are fearful, be strong. In the book of Haggai, chapter 2, verse 4, Zerubbabel was instructed to be strong. God is telling you, be strong, be strong. In the book of Zechariah, chapter 8, verse 9, all those who have heard the hearing of the word of God from the prophet was encouraged to be strong. You have heard the word tonight. God is telling you, be strong. It does not matter what you are going through. God say, be strong, be strong. Apostle Paul wrote to evangelist, his spiritual son, Timothy, and told him, be strong. God is telling you to be strong. Won't you be strong? Won't you rise up and be strong? God said, be strong. It does not matter what you've gone through, be strong. Many people are like jelly. A little bit, they just, mm, they melt. Little thing, they just roo, 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 crocodile tears. They have nothing, they don't know anything except to cry. That's what they do. But God said, be strong. Be strong. And sometimes people think if you don't cry, it means you are so hardened. You are so hardened. You have no, you, you have no soft heart. You don't need to cry crocodile tears. When you're supposed to be strong, you need to be strong. Well, the tears of joy can rush through your eyes, but not the tears of self-pity. Many people are self-pity. Why must it be me? Why must it be me? Why must it be me? If it's not, who will it be? Me? It has to be you. Yeah. Why must it be me? Then you want it to be who? You see, we want it to be somebody else, but not us. That somebody else also is somebody, you know, who feels the pain. God said be strong. Be strong. You know why we are not strong? Because we never know what it means to draw from the power of prayer. A man or woman who kneels before the throne of God can stand against all powers of darkness. How much time do you spend praying? We don't talk about praying 
chanting. Some people are chanting, say they are praying. We talk about prayer that carries weight, prayer that carries power, prayer that when you open your mouth, devil will flee. Bible says, resist him and he will flee. Therefore, be strong. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the power of his might. God has made available all the resources that can help you to come against the powers of darkness. Our problem is this. We are not interested in allowing God to be God. We are not interested in obeying God's word. We want to do our own thing. That's our problem. And devil will continue to condemn you because you did like this, because you did like this. That's why you're suffering. That's why you're suffering. You forget to know that God said, I will not remember their sins anymore. You're not suffering because you're a sinner unless you have purposely gone and committed sin, commit sin anyway. But tonight God said, be strong. Be strong. Rise up and be strong. Rise up and let the light of the Lord shine through you. Rise up and see there is light at the end of the tunnel. Rise up and be the person that God can be proud of. You know, God is just sitting over there and watching you and saying, will this my child represent me? You are called to be God's workmanship, created in God's image through Christ Jesus. You are called to be Christ's ambassador, to represent him wherever you go. You are called to be the righteous of the, of the Lord. That's what you are called. You are called to be a real person of God, a reborn again. Are you the person? Will God be proud of you? When your name is mentioned in heaven, will the heavens say hallelujah, amen, or will they say, Tch. they spit out? Because your name is not good in the ears. You have polluted the name of the Lord. Think about your life. God wants you to come out. Be that person he can be proud of. Be that person he can say, yes, this is my child. You know, when I read through the book of Job, the Bible told us what God said. And God saw Satan and said, Satan, where are you coming from? He said, coming up and down to and fro from the earth. And God said, have you seen my son Job? What a testimony. Look at God giving testimony of a human being. Have you seen my son Job? A man who shunned evil, a blameless man, an upright man. God testified. What about you? What will God say about you? When your name is mentioned, Will God ever mention your name in the first place? Here God talked about Job. What about Abraham, whose faith was counted as righteousness? What about Noah, who was the only righteous man during his time? What about Lot, who was the righteous man in Sodom and Gomorrah? Will you be the only person God can be proud of? When God comes in DLCC, when he says, okay, this is the person I found in DLCC, will you be that person? That's a question. Are you so conscious of what God will think about you when you stand before him? Have you think, thought about all this? And say, what will be opinion of God about me? When Apostle Paul was writing to the church of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, he said, examine yourself. Every day, do self-examination. Check yourself up. Check your life through the mirror of the word. Remember, Character is the true mirror that shows your true image. Character is the mirror that shows your true image. Let the mirror of God's word show who you are. In secret, in the public, the way you are. Some people are angels in the public, but in the secret life, they are rotten eggs. Is that the way we live? God doesn't condemn us, but God wants us to live right. That will bring glory to his name. Therefore, let us be strong in the Lord in order to possess our possession. Let us be strong in the Lord in order to enforce the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ upon the devil. The Bible told us in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57, Thanks be to God who gave us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17, 14, 15, and 16. 17 says, Thanks be to God who make us victorious, who make us triumphant. That's all we thank God for because he has led us thus far. Now, turn your Bible before we close. In the book of Isaiah, one more time. Maybe you've been looking at devil, and devil have been chasing you, coming in like a flood. Turn your Bible in the book of Isaiah 59. Look at verse 19. Isaiah 59, 
verse 19. It says, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. You hear that? When the devil come against you, the spirit of the Lord in you will lift up a standard. The devil cannot stand. Because he that's in you is greater than he that's in the world. When the enemy comes in like a flood, God will sweep him away. When the enemy comes against you, God will tame it. The Bible declares in the book of Isaiah 54, in verse 10, it says, Mountains and hills shall depart, but God's kindness and mercy will never depart from us. In verse 17, it says, No weapon formed against us shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against us, we shall rebuke. This is our inheritance. And not only that, in the book of Isaiah 49, verse 15 and 16, God said, Behold, I have graven you in my palms, and your walls are continually before me. That's what it says. A mother may forget the child she breastfeeds, but God will never forget you because you are treasured. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 22, God said, I will not leave you nor forsake you. Why? Because of my great name's sake, for you are called by my name. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1 and 2, God said, You are mine. When you cross the rivers, it will not overflow you. When you go to the sea, you will not drown. When you go to the fire, you will not be burnt. That's God. These are promises of God. Be strong. Be strong. Don't think that God has forsaken you. Don't think that God doesn't remember you. Don't think that God has completely wiped out your name. No. Devil is trying to deceive you. Remember, God said tonight, be strong in your faith. Be strong, my people. Be strong. Be strong. March on like army. March on. Don't let the devil to cow you down. You must not be fearful. You must not fret. But stand still and see the goodness of the Lord. That's what he said in the book of Isaiah. 41 verse 10. He said, fear not. I will help you. I will hold you with the right hand of my righteousness. And I will hold. I will help you. In verse 12, 13 and 14. In verse 13 he said, those who are incensed against you, you will look for them, you will see them no more. They will be like non-existent things. This is God. Be strong. Regardless of what you are going through, only do what? Be strong and believe that God is able to protect, to secure, and to prove himself in your life. Just tell God, Lord, sanctify yourself in this situation, and God will prove himself. When you hear the voice of God, do not harden your heart.